What's up guys? This is Manoj Paptani. I welcome you all on behalf of the IDpedia world. So, we have already done and completed and we are through with three of our presentations relating to the topic of portfolio management. This is going to be the last video presentation in which I'm going to discuss with you the remaining topics relating to portfolio management. Post this presentation, I've got one more presentation which I have for you guys and that will be relating to the questions which have already been asked in CE final examination with respect to the topic of portfolio management. So there is one very peculiar thing about portfolio management. Okay, guys, I've seen and witnessed the past trends and the past examination questions and there I got to know that the kind of questions which are basically being asked with the topic of portfolio management, they usually remain the same and not just with this one with a few topics, okay, just like portfolio management, mergers and acquisitions. These are the topics wherein the kind of questions are very much similar because in both the scenarios, if I talk about portfolio management, herein everything goes like in and around the formula part, okay. You have your formula in your mind, you have grabbed the concepts, just shoot the formula and get the things done, completed. In case of mergers and acquisitions, which I'll be taking care of after completion of portfolio management, I have actually seen one thing, the most of the questions are revolving around one part, which is what would be the EPS, okay, what would be the earning per share of the company post mergers, okay. That is one single thing which is being asked in N number of C final examinations, if I'll talk about. So what will be the valuation of the company post merger, I mean, that is something which will be like asked. So I have incorporated one presentation for the portfolio management questions as well in this chapter so you'll be seeing that particular presentation post the fourth one so fifth presentation is gonna be only and only on the kind of questions that have already been asked in C final examinations relating to the topic of portfolio management this one is gonna be the last one in which i'm gonna discuss with you the remaining topics relating to the portfolio management so are you guys all set are you guys excited wonderful guys and i'm sure that you guys must be revising your topics remember that Revision is the key to sail through your C final examinations. Remember that. Go over it. So first time we seat belts, we're about to take off with the first topic of the day, and that will be relating to correlation and diversification. Guys, let's uh, see the first one, the first table which I have made for you. Okay? The first box, we have got three boxes over here. One is when the correlation is plus one, that is positive one. Second one comes out to be when the correlation is negative one, okay? And lastly, when the correlation is zero. Let's understand what do I mean by the first one, which is when the correlation is the positive one. It will be only and only if in case the two securities or the market security, market and the security, any way around, are perfectly positively correlated. That is the nature when correlation is plus one, that is positive one. That simply means that the market is, the nature of security with the market is perfectly positively correlated. It simply means that both the investments do not offset each other, okay? Both the securities, or I can say that the market and the security is moving in the same direction, okay? Both of them are growing. So, can diversification be able to be done in this particular scenario? No, diversification cannot be done. It can be done at all. Because both of them are moving in the same direction. Both of them are going ahead. Okay, maybe going ahead or maybe going down. So can you just change one thing for another one? No, there is no point because both of them are going down or both of them are going up. So investments do not offset each other. That is when the correlation is positive one. It simply means that they are perfectly positively correlated. Number one. Number two, when the correlation is negative one, it simply means that they are perfectly negatively correlated. Okay. Investments offset each other completely. One is going up, second one is going down. One is going down, second one is going up. So can the diversification is possible? Absolutely. Full diversification is possible and the same can be achieved. That is when the nature is perfectly negatively correlated. And when does it happen? When the correlation is negative one. And lastly, when the correlation is zero, it simply means that no correlation is available, which is you can't predict. Okay. You can't just predict the movement of the investments. Okay. You can't be aware of this thing, whether the securities will go up or the second security will go down, whether the security will 
go on a similar uh, direction or they will go opposite so no diversification is possible in this case because it is certainly not a good diversification and you can't predict which way it will go so the nature will be no correlation so when you are not aware of it correlation is zero in this form this is all about correlation and diversification so when the next time you get a chance and somebody ask you dude i've got this correlation which is positive one so should i go for diversification tell him no because the movement is in the same direction when they ask you the correlation is negative one should i go ahead with the diversification tell them up yes do not wait for it just go because they are moving in the opposite direction so go with the one which is making you landing up with n number of profitable opportunities and when the correlation is zero certainly tell them up because the market is unpredictable so it's better to keep yourself out of it no correlation that's what this topic was all about simple guys on the tips cool let's go ahead with the next topic and which is beta beta as a measure of systematic risk remember guys in my last presentation i made you aware about one thing which is beta is something which is a measure of systematic risk and systematic remember that example that mother example throwing up your water bottle your bag in the right places so beta is something which is a measure of systematic risk and systematic risk is something which cannot be diversified away okay systematic risk only and only happen when the risk is relating to economy something is going in the complete economy you can't change it at all okay if there is something mesh up happening with a company or an industry that will be termed as the combination of systematic as well as unsystematic risk okay there you can use standard deviation but if i'll talk about the systematic risk okay the one which cannot be diversified away beta is the measure of it so how do we find beta how do we calculate beta beta will be like very simply uh, it can be derived which is with the formula and the concept of covariance between the security and the market okay what is the covariance figure between the security and the market okay divide the same with variance of market market variance has to be used in order to calculate the beta so covariance between the security and the market divided by the market variance so now guys let us interpret beta okay so when i say the beta is positive you have seen in many of the questions that people tell you of the beta is let's say 1.1 let's say positive 1 which is plus 1 okay so this plus sign it basically indicates what that the stock moves in the same direction as the market okay if i say that uh, the beta for me that has to be compared with the overall beta of the market and my beta is let's say 1.25 positive so what i i can presume with this particular thing is that if the market will be affected 1% with something my security is going to be affected 1.25% but that affection will happen in the same direction okay both of us will get affected in the same direction if the market is going up with 1% i will also go up but with 1.25% because my beta is positive 1.25 so this simply indicates that the stock is going to be moving in the same direction as the market negative sign basically means that the stock moves in opposite direction as market let's suppose i say my beta is minus 1.25 so what's going to happen is if the market will go up by 1% my security will go down by 1.25% because the sign is negative in this case and zero means unaffected by the market movements if the beta is zero for any of the security it simply means that if the market is going like 1 2 3 anything my security will be like unaffected by the market movement whether it goes up it goes down anything everything nothing will happen to my security this is what beta is all about i guess you guys have got complete understanding about beta in this scenario always remember one thing uh, which i would like to mention you guys because just remember this that if the beta is uh, providing the same going into the same direction it will be in the positive okay if the beta is indicating something negative okay beta is in negative term okay negative form then it simply means that the stock will move in opposite direction from the market okay but then the gravity the intensity will be depending on the number that will be like if the beta is 2 i simply mean that the beta for my security is 2 then it simply means that any if anything happens to the market in the gravity of 1 it will affect my security in the gravity of 
always remember and do not get confused with positive negative with the figures figures are altogether different figures will be something which will provide you the intensity okay the way which will get hit positive negative will provide you the directions in which you will get hit that's it that's all about beta that is one thing which i wanted to convey to you guys now what is the difference between the standard deviation and beta standard deviation is a measure of total risk guys when i say total risk that is something which is really in relation to your individual security okay whenever you purchase an individual security if i talk about okay uh, a particular security let's suppose abc company okay so here and if someone comes up to me and ask what kind of risk factor should i consider into my picture i always recommend them that go for standard deviation because it is the measure of total risk because you are investing in just one single security there is a very good chance that it will have systematic risk as well as unsystematic risk because here the diversification of uh, the risk hasn't been eliminated as of now so always go for it but when i talk about beta it is a measure of systematic risk when would i recommend someone to go for beta only if in case they are investing in some portfolios okay and that are directly aligned with the market okay now is there some chance that there would be some kind of unsystematic risk no because that has already been diversified away so now you are investing into efficient portfolios wherein there is no chance of getting into unsystematic risk so since there is no chance of getting into unsystematic risk go ahead with the one which is a measure of systematic risk and that is beta so for individual security investor who invests only in one security one stock there in standard deviation is the relevant measure of risk but for a portfolio investor who invests his money in a portfolio beta is a relevant measure of risk clear guys sorted with this thing wonderful next comes in capm capm model that is capital asset pricing model one of the most lucrative most exciting most asked question and kind of most favorite one from all of the examiners it's a very simple stuff very simple formula very simple concept but maybe it's way too simple so it's one of the most favorite ones amongst all the examiners because uh, i guess in every attempt you get to see at least one question relating to your capm model so capm basically simply means it says return on a security will be equal to your risk free return plus your beta multiplied by risk market risk premium okay so what does this particular uh, formula stands for okay let's get into the detailing of it in order to make you understand this concept very clear okay guys you invest something in your let's say treasury bond okay government is providing you some kind of treasury bonds for that they are providing you 6% interest now you have got one thing you simply go to the bank and you say bank bank i want treasury bond from government okay kindly provide me a 6% interest which is risk free bank says cool we can do it for you they'll provide you the risk free interest but then you just walk out of your bank and you think about this thing why shouldn't i invest this amount in equity then two devil comes into your head one is angel another one is devil devil comes up with one respect okay go ahead with it go ahead with it because that will provide you higher amount of returns and at the same time that angel which is standing into your head angel is telling you don't go with it because you won't be able to get your risk free return okay simple now the thing is in this particular scenario you come up with a particular conclusion which is that if i am taking up some amount of risk obviously my return has to get increased or otherwise i can simply go ahead with my risk free interest simple so capa model is all about that particular scenario which is if in case you are going ahead with your treasury bonds you just stay happy and contentful with your risk free interest but if you are investing into your equity here you get a chance to get higher amount of returns and what is that one factor which basically defines your excessive return that is something which is in the second part that is beta multiplied by return of the market minus risk free so what amount are you taking as your risk okay you are taking up let's say market return is 14% okay 14 minus 6 8% is the risk that you are taking up now beta is something with which it is multiplied because beta is something which will be affecting individual stock of individual 
companies separately so maybe you are investing in abc company limited wherein the beta is just 1 so 1 multiplied by 14 minus 6 it comes out 8 8 plus your risk free interest that will be 14 percent simple but there might be another company with xyz limited and it has it is having a beta of 2 so now here the risk factor is double so in this particular scenario beta will be 2 brackets rm that is return on market which is 14 percent minus 6 percent which is the risk free interest you get the figure of 8 over here but you'll have to multiply it with 2 because you are bearing double risk okay because your beta is double over here so you get 8 into 2 16 plus risk free interest which is 6 percent so you get an overall return on security as 22 this is what kappa model is all about final conclusion line which is if you are going ahead with your treasury bond and risk-free security stay happy and contentful with rf which is risk-free interest in this case your return on security will be equal to rf but if in case you are investing in some amount of equity here you get a chance to play around with beta as well as your getting into your pocket your market returns so you will add another thing to it which is beta multiplied by market risk premium that risk premium which you are getting out of it and that will be all about in this kappa model then there are a few assumptions which are underlying the kappa model number one is investors are risk averse again the very same thing number two everyone in the market has got some same forecast they are having the same information and which is available to all of them okay Number three, investment opportunities are same for all the investors, whether it's Mukesh Ambani or it's you. Investment opportunities are going to be same for all the investors. Fourth, which is the most common one amongst all the assumptions that there will be no transaction costs or taxation, which is just not possible, but still is that's the only reason why it is called as assumptions. And lastly, that the investor can borrow or lend freely at the risk-free rate of return. You go to any bank, you just ask for loan and they'll provide you at the risk free rates. These are the assumptions which are underlying Kappa model. A very similar kind of assumptions which are available in mostly each and every one of the theory. So I hope you guys are clear and thorough with this Kappa model. And certainly if in case the question arises at your examination, you'll be able to solve it down very easily. Next comes in security market line versus capital market line. What do I mean by security market line and capital market line as the name is suggesting security market line what do you think guys security market line that will be something which is just a perfect equation for what the expected return versus beta that is your systematic risk it is basically a line wherein you get the understanding okay regarding to individual securities security market line but if i talk about capital market line therein you get a chance to have the combination of risky assets and risk-free asset as well. So herein you get a chance to go ahead with the portfolios, capital market line. Security market line means simple single securities, individual securities or portfolios. Capital market line, overall market portfolio is complete. So SML, that is the security market line, is nothing but a plot of expected return versus beta, which is the systematic risk. And on the other hand, CML is the plot of expected return versus SD that is total risk. Now you guys will be thinking about one thing that as of now in the last presentation, uh, the last slide I just told you of whenever you get to choose between a security, if you are going ahead with a particular security and you get to choose with which measure we need to use, therein I told you of that you should go for standard deviation. Why? Because here in a particular security, there are good amount of chances that you'll get a systematic risk as well as unsystematic risk. Okay. Then why? am I doing it here the opposite thing which is I'm classifying with a plot of line with expected return versus beta for SML that is what I am doing not because I am telling you up this is what SML is talking about okay security market line it is basically equation which is providing a plot of expected return versus beta okay they are not telling that we should go ahead with the total risk or systematic risk in this particular scenario they are basically comparing the situation with respect to the equation okay they could have taken any other measure as well over here not just beta or sd or maybe any other measure but then for the equation part sml has been drafted in such a way that it provides the plot of expected return versus beta which is the systematic risk and not sd that is total risk total risk will be taken care of 
with CML, which is the plot of expected return versus SD. In this way, they have basically drafted these two equations. So what do SML and CML stands for and what uh, do they mean? Simply, on SML, we have those individual securities or portfolios which may be efficient. Okay, guys, which may or may not be efficient. So for that parameter, they are using beta. But on CML, we can have only a combination of risky assets or risk-free asset. Individual securities do not exist on CML. So only portfolios exist, which are considered more efficient than the portfolios lying on efficient printer. So we are using here SD as a measure because uh, herein they have got a combination of risky and risk-free assets. Though they are saying that they are more efficient than the portfolios lying on the efficient frontier, but then still this CML thinks about on these lines that there might be a possibility that unsystematic risk is still available on those portfolios and which needs to be diversified away. This is what the thinking of CML equation is all about. And this is what the thinking of SML, wherein I tell you that they say that uh, you invest in your individual securities or portfolio, which may be efficient. So basically they are drafting with this practice that they, yes, they are efficient and they only require a measure for systematic risk. They do not want the unsystematic risk measure. So that is the only reason why they are going ahead with beta and not SD wherein SML is concerned. So I hope you guys are now clear with uh, the basic difference between what I told you in my last slide and what is this thing this picture which is sml and cml talks about clear guys started with this one wonderful next comes the last one the last topic of the day and that will be with arbitrage pricing theory and sharp index model these two are the major theories about the portfolio management chapter if i talk about the kind of questions which are already asked in, which have been uh, already asked in ca final examinations both of them have seldom been asked, okay? I have seen the entire modules, entire things, but then these two topics form a core part of uh, portfolio management, okay? They they are the major important topics, okay? And I wanted to cover this with you. So just for your knowledge sakes, kindly, uh, kindly bear with me and understand what this uh, arbitrage pricing theory and sharp index model is all about. Though I'm not assuring you of that, yes, this question will definitely come in an examination, but you never know, it's, it's a CA final examinations and anything can happen. So according to arbitrage pricing theory, which I talk about, it says that stocks behave very differently, okay, due to various different factors. So a person can form a portfolio using various stocks in such a way wherein you tend to get an opportunity that you buy some stocks and you at the very other hand you sell some uh, stocks we would still be having a zero investment portfolio okay which is giving you some amount of return there are seldom chances that you'll get some kind of return with zero investment portfolios but if such a portfolio provides you a return then surely you can go ahead and do your arbitrage and you can make some profits so this is what arbitrage pricing model is all about as per the arbitrage pricing model and its theory expected return on a security you can find with the help of risk-free rate of return plus sigma factor sensitivities multiplied by factor premiums all these figures if in case this question appears in your examination you'll get all the three figures and you'll be asked that what is the expected return on the security so that will be simply your risk-free rate of return plus your factor sensitivities multiplied by your factor premiums okay let's suppose you are investing in your three securities one is 30 0.30 sensitive another one comes out to be let's say 0.25 percent sensitive then comes 0.10 and what is the amount of premium that you are getting if in case you are investing into that security multiply those premiums with it add to your risk free rate of return and you'll get your expected return on security with the help of apt this was what arbitrage pricing theory is all about next comes in your sharp index model so sharp index model is basically having a formula it's set pattern formula you will have to and have to retain this formula because this is the only way out and you will understand uh, with relation to the sharp index thing so it says ri which is your expected return on your security will be equal to your alpha i which is your y intercept of characteristic line or alpha coefficient plus beta i which is a slope of characteristic line or beta coefficient plus the same has to be multiplied with 
RM, which is your market return, return on the market, which index you'll get, plus to that error term, okay, that is something which is forming a part of this RI, okay. So RI will be equal to sigma I plus beta I multiplied by RM plus EI, which is your error term. This is the model which was derived by Sharp. It's in full length about like so many pages. This is the last derivation which we get out of it. Okay. And all you need to do is just simply get your alpha, add to it your beta, multiply it with your return on market and add error term to it and you'll get the RI. Though this question will never be like asked in your an examination, but still this has to be retained by you. So kindly retain and revise this topic. Okay. Retain this formula in your mind so that if in case there is a good a possibility that it might appear in your examination. And so you just need to know this formula in order to attempt the question. So therein you'll be able to get your expected rate of return. So with this, this complete chapter of portfolio management is being summed up. It's complete. If in case you have liked this video, if in case you have found this video useful, informative, kindly do share it with your friends as much as you can. Thank you. On behalf of the IDPedia world, stay connected with me. I'll see you in the next presentation with a lot more questions. Till then, stay in best of your health and spirit and take care. God bless you all. Bye.